I am terribly excited for what we've got lined up tonight. Greetings, salutations all. Friday means Gus Talks. Three ingredients are good drink, good smoke, and good company. That's where you come in. This is, of course, if you'll oblige me. The good company is, of course, the most integral ingredient. In Gus Talks, we tend to delve into deeper topics, something typically outside the purview of games, where we talk about and philosophize about all manner of things. And I am particularly excited for this one, friends. Tonight's topic is about value. What do I mean value? What is value? Perhaps asked another way, what has value? This topic, the ground that I want to cover, is born of a conversation, a real-life Gus talk that I gave two weeks ago now. I'll, I'll tell you the story because you'll enjoy the setup. I was with military, doing military stuff and things. A young person who was there said, sort of aloud, I don't really understand crypto, but you know, everybody seems to be doing it. And I figured I got a spare paycheck that didn't really need to go to anything. So what the heck? I just bought some. Pretty sure Warren Buffett said something about that once. Wrote something about, hmm, don't invest in something you don't understand. And someone else chimed in, I don't really understand crypto either, but I feel like it's something that I'm supposed to be buying. And then a third person said, I don't really understand it either. And I went, all right, here's a teachable moment. Gather around, children. Let me explain to you what crypto is. But first, goats and carrots. In order to fully understand value, we're going to talk some history, money, fiat, government, because in order to understand crypto, you need to understand all the rest of this. It's functionally very simple to understand and philosophically it's also easy to understand but i'll bet you very few people have ever had it explained to them they just think that it's this hype thing that they can jump on board and make money and that's great i believe there's a proverb that says something about get rich quick schemes probably look that one up <laughs> so that's how this began if you haven't been scared off yet by this mug or this mug that's good that's a good start hmm Mm. All right, let's go back. Let's go thousands of years back. What was of value? Food, shelter, water. So all of your time, all of your energy goes toward getting secure on just these things. Food, water, shelter. We were an agrarian people doing agrarian things. You spent all day tending the farm, tending the ranch. Everybody has to do everything themselves. You did that from sunup to sundown. That was it. That was your life. That's the beginning of our story. What do you have? Goats and carrots. Tale as old as time. You're a goat farmer when well, you've got goats and you need vegetables in your life lest you have scurvy. And so you say to your neighbor who grows carrots, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a goat of which I have plenty for some of your carrots of which you have a surplus. Ah, uh, let's see what's fair. Uh, I don't know, it takes this much time to grow a goat, it takes this much energy and grazing and all of this care, uh, versus how much it takes for carrots to all be grown and harvested and all that stuff. Uh, let's do X number of carrots, this many, I don't know, for a goat. Bartering. Now, okay, obviously, this works, but it's not ideal for reasons we're about to get into. We see its benefits. Yes, you have something that I need. I have something that you need, let us trade. But you don't always have a goat with you. So what are you gonna do? How are you going to make this not so bulky and awful? Because it's bulky and awful. So what do you find? You find immediate use of an IOU system, which is, all right, I don't have that many goats with me at the moment to trade for the carrots that I need from you. Tell you what, I will, while I'm here and have my cart, I'll take carrots from you today. And on Tuesday, I'll get you the goat that I owe you. Great, that was a social credit system. This is, hey, yeah, every time you've promised something, you've been good for it, so I will trust you again. Or so they said, I'll get you a goat next week, and you say, no, you haven't proven reliable in the past. That's the earliest system of credit. Okay, here's where we're going. Ooh, I'm excited. Oh, I'm fired up. We're still in our system of goats and carrots. So here's the question. How is it that you're going to express value in exchange for something in the days when a goat is your currency of choice? It's very difficult to carry goats around. Enter money. When you spend less time working on a farm, it means that you can spend more time doing other things. Enter intellectuals, orators, philosophers. They didn't bring something physical to market, to trade. So now the system includes stuff like bards. We'll sing for food. We'll dance for food. Whatever. Whatever it is you bring that someone else finds of value. Fascinating, right? 
So money changes the game. Money is a fascinating thing. Money has a definition. Money has properties. Money is a kind of IOU. Okay, follow me here. The definition of money is a unit of measure that is generally accepted and recognized as a medium of exchange in the economy. Now, that's a modern definition of it, but the crux of that goes absolutely all the way back to goats and carrots. What constitutes money by definition? What we call money must have certain qualities. First is fungibility. Now, many of you will actually know the word fungible these days because of NFTs, which is hilarious. Maybe you know NFTs, but you don't know what fungibility means. Fungibility means that individual units should be interchangeable with each other. This means that 10 US dollars can be exchanged for two fives. They have interchangeability. That's the fun way of saying it needs to be divisible. Hard to divide a goat. Not impossible, but hard to do on the spot. And you can't take pieces of a goat and say, oh yeah, yeah, all these together equal the goat. Because part of the benefit of a whole goat is that it is alive and it can multiply. So goat's no good with divisibility. Then the next quality that has to be here for money is stability. This means that it holds a relatively consistent value. It doesn't decay in value. What you have today will be the same tomorrow. If I am given $100 today, outside of certain circumstances and a crazy economy right now, that $100 will buy me the same stuff tomorrow. Recognizability needs to be identifiable. Someone needs to look at it, be able to tell what it is, yes. Portability, and this is one that perhaps many of you will have thought of. It's the one that I thought of right away, it's portability. You can't carry goats in your pocket. It needs to be conveniently carried or transported, plain and simple. And finally, durability. It needs to be able to withstand repeated use or changing of hands, okay? Now, think about the euro. Think about the rupee. Think about pound sterling. Think about what it is you use. What are they? Well, the US dollar is a fascinating thing. It has these qualities. It's got fungibility. You can divide it. It's divisible into smaller and smaller components to a point. Stability, consistent value. Yeah, sort of, minus inflation, which we'll get to. Um, but what if I have a $100 bill today? It'll be worth $100, the same value tomorrow. That's key here. Recognizability, everybody knows it. They recognize it. They see it. They know what it is. When you hand it to someone, they know why you're handing it to them. Portability, obviously. This is paper, sort of. It's sort of a paper. It's technically cloth, but it's very light very portable. And then durability. It can withstand repeated use and changing of hands. Now, another quality is scarcity. If it's unlimited, you can't use it for money, like sand. You can't have sand be currency because it's everywhere. A fistful of it means nothing because anybody could just reach down and get their own fistful of it. It has to be reasonable scarcity and desirability to having this thing. Now, what it is is interesting. You could want it for its own sake. The example that I'm going for here is gold. Why did people want it back then? Gold is a promissory note. That is, gold is an IOU. Gold became a currency. It became money, one of the first kinds. It became an understood medium by which you could exchange things, goods and services, time and talent and all those things. You could express the value of those things with gold. I could say, all right, I want that goat. And they say, what do you have to exchange for it? Nothing. Well, why would I barter with you? Except for this gold. Gold has a bunch of neat properties that are great for a lot of things, but people didn't know about those things back in the day. Why did they want gold? Gold, for the most part, ticks all these boxes. It's durable. It's portable, kind of. It's recognizable. You could test to see if it was the real thing. You could bite on it, for instance, to see if it was soft. Stable because of its relative rarity had to find it. You couldn't just grab fistfuls of it out of the ground. And it was fungible. You could have dust, you could have nuggets, you could have bricks, whatever it is, it can be split. Now, those aren't ideal, obviously, but it worked. It matched all of these things. But now there's a system of understanding in this community where this would have began that this gold shiny stuff has transferable value. And now he knows he can take that amount of gold and go buy not only carrots, but also butchering services, feed services for his goats, buy more land, whatever. This gold now had value. What value? What is that? Why is it of value? Yeah, it meets the definition for money. Yeah, it's durable and recognizable and it's rare and sure, all those things, that's great. That makes it useful for being this common medium of exchange. Sure, it's pragmatic, it's efficient, it's easier than the simple barter system, sure. But what gives the gold its value. That gold 
has no intrinsic value. Why does it work in that communal sense as money? What value is there in it? The communal sense that it does. The communal belief that it does. The agreement, the accord that everyone has. The understanding that it has value. In this particular context that we're talking about right here, just at this level, that's what gives something financial value. So this brings us to the next phase, next chapter of all of this. You understand money and why it has value because everybody agrees that it does. Now, they are all a promissory note. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to get too far away from that. They are a promissory note of what? That this will be worth something when you go to spend it, right? You give the guy a bunch of gold for his goat. He takes the gold on the understanding that that gold will be worth something to other people. It's an IOU. This is a promissory note. That's fascinating to me. It's a system of trust. It's a social contract of trust and of understanding and of belief that it has value. Now, how far does that belief extend? A bunch of countries virtually everywhere used it. Why? Because the system of understanding that gold carried with it value spread far and wide, all over. And so people could take gold all over and have that be worth something wherever they went. The next extension of this was people saying gold is great. It does all of these things, but it's not perfect. Gold has its own flaws, right? It's only portable to a point. Gold is heavy. It's only divisible to a point. Now you have to have scales everywhere you go and you have to weigh it. It was pretty good, but it wasn't perfect. It's not ideal. So what do we do? A bunch of countries decided, what if we do a placeholder for gold that's also an IOU for gold? So they move away from pure gold and they go to coinage. Coins were similar. They were made of gold often, sometimes silver, sometimes lesser metals. It moved away from just lumps of gold to something that was a standard-ish weight and a standard-ish size. That's an improvement. That's great. Now you can do exchange more easily, more readily. You don't need scales for everything. That's great. It's a good start. But we still run into a lot of the problems that gold had. So we start to get to the era of paper money. I'm going to keep calling it paper because you know what it is. Now, back in the day, you guys perhaps will be familiar with a thing called the gold standard. The gold standard meant that each promissory note, that's a US dollar again in this particular case, right, was worth a certain amount of gold. It had gold backing it. Again, these were IOU notes, right? You could, back in the day, take that $100 bill to a bank and say, yeah, I would like my gold, please. And they would take that dollar and hand you the equivalent amount of gold. You could, at any given time, exchange your dollars for gold because the dollars were worth a fixed amount of gold. That was the gold standard. So you only printed as much money as you had gold to back it up. Now, why were people willing to use paper now instead of gold? Why would they hand the gold off to someone else in exchange for what was basically useless? Because they agreed to. Because again, everybody got on the same page and said, no, no, we agree that this green piece of paper is going to be worth something. The piece of paper itself was worth nothing. It was a promise. That promise is only as good as the trustworthiness of the people in on the accord. Now, the gold standard was very strict in this regard. You could only print so much as there was gold behind it, right? And we constantly mined gold, constantly pulled it out of the ground at expense, yes. And so it continued to have this rarity and desirability, and we forged it all into gold bars, and they all went into Fort Knox, and that's what you knew back in the day meant that your dollar was worth something, because it was worth the gold in the vaults. Anytime you could exchange it. To this day, the bank will have X amount minimum of your money available at any given time. You are taking them at their word that it's back there. You don't get to see the vault. You don't get to go back there and see piles of money. You certainly don't go back and see gold bars because then we moved away from the gold standard. This is where things get fascinating. And this is where our story truly begins. What happens if we get rid of the gold? What changes about the social contract? What changes about how we interact with one another and this green paper or, you know, pink paper, orange paper, whatever color it is, wherever you are in the world? What happens? when there isn't gold behind it anymore. Why does it get to continue as a functioning, meaningful promissory note when it no longer has the IOU behind it? Because people agree it must. The social contract means it must hold value. 
Now, there's nothing behind it. This is fiat. F-I-A-T. Fiat currency. This means it exists without something behind it. It is a system of understanding. This is, interestingly, an IOU for an IOU. Because gold is an IOU, right? It's, uh, you give me this in exchange for a goat. It's an IOU this much value. Whatever that valuation happens to be at the time. Whatever it is you're bartering for. The gold itself was no use to you. You couldn't eat it. Eventually, you needed to trade it for something tangible, something uh, useful. That's food, water, shelter. You exchanged it for those things. It's an IOU. Fiat currencies are an IOU for an IOU. So now we've got a bit of uh, inception on the currencies here. That is what we have today. A US dollar is only as good as someone is willing to accept it. You go to the store right now, you bring money. Why do they accept your money? That store will take your money on the expectation that it can then take that money and exchange it for something that it wants. A new location, perhaps. New shopping carts for their store. A security system. That money has value in all of these different fields for tangible goods, but also for services, right? That money can mean so many things only because everyone believes that it does. That's fiat. And if you've never thought about that before, if you've never paused, think about the fragility of that. I invite you to do so now. Now, here's the next bit of nuance behind this. What is behind that fiat, if not gold? What is behind it that means it's worth something? How do you know that that money is any good? Well, strange things start to happen when you examine this, okay? This is where inflation comes in. If I have 10 gold bars, or say I had nine for easy math, and that's all of the money that there is in the system. And that's the economy. Congratulations, me. But you go out and you mine gold, you smelt it into a bar, and you come into the room now with your gold bar. What just happened? All of my gold bars just went down in value. That's inflation. 100% of the economy was mine. Now I've got nine gold bars, you've got one. You now control a tenth of the economy, and all of mine just devalued by a tenth. That happens every time we print dollars or euros or whatever the heck else. It happens every single time we print more. The ones that you have devalue. Each of those pieces of paper is worth less and less and less and less. The more that is printed, the less each one is worth. Once you get to a certain point, scarcity is gone. Scarcity. It's one of our key factors of what money is, right? Relative scarcity. You can't just reach down to the ground, scoop up a fistful of it like you can sand. We can't use it as money for that reason. But what if there's so many dollars printed that you could just scoop down and pick up a fistful of them off the street? They lose all their value. And that's what runaway hyperinflation does. You see that in Zimbabwe, where they have a single bill that's worth 10 million. The zeros at a certain point stop meaning. Now, remember when I said you only printed during the gold standard as much cash as you could have backed by gold? That standard no longer exists. Now the standard is you print only so much money that it doesn't really cripple the economy to do so. It means that you kind of need to keep your money in circulation because otherwise it loses value. Now, what if they printed all of that money and just put it away some, put it in a warehouse and you didn't know about it? Nothing would change. But because there are systems in place in the world that make it known how much money is in circulation, we can know at any given time the relative devaluation of what it is we're currently holding. That's important. It means that we, as functioning humans, can make a judgment call. You can decide for yourself something. What is it that you have to decide? Whether or not you trust the system. As more and more US dollars are printed, money printer go burr, right? People are withdrawing from that system. Why? Because they're losing trust in that system. That's a key insight, is understanding that this comes down to a belief that it works. A belief in the system. Now, there are other things behind fiat. Let me ask you this. Why is the US dollar worth something outside of the US? Because of the US military. That is a big chunk of it. In this particular case, our fiat currency is backed up, not by gold, but by bombs. Because we have a robust military, we have the force to back it up. And it's not just the US. The same can be said for all governments that have currency that's used somewhere else. Now. Why can't people in Zimbabwe come here to the US and use that Zimbabwe money, that $10 billion note, and go to the grocery store and exchange it for something in cellophane that they can eat? Because we don't trust that it has value. We as the US don't assign value 
to that currency because their government is in shambles. That's why they have runaway inflation. This is right back to our first observation of the very first IOU system back in the bartering days, back when you said, I don't have my goat with me, but I will take your carrots now and I will get the goat to you tomorrow. You only did that exchange if you trusted the person behind the exchange. You trusted that they had a goat and that they would deliver the goat. The same thing happens today. We say, I don't trust that your currency is stable enough to have value to me. What value? The same value. I don't trust that if I take that dollar, that, that $10 billion note from you from Zimbabwe, I don't trust that I can exchange that for food, water, or shelter, or whatever else you want. I don't value it because I don't trust that it's worth something. It's still a social system of trust, except now it's done at a macro level. Back in the day, it was, do you trust the man with the goat? Well, he's my neighbor. I've known him for 20 years and he's always been good for goat. Now it's countries. Now it's blocks. Now it's huge macro. Well, isn't that interesting? Are you making individual decisions about whether or not you trust Chinese currency? Hmm. There's been a common thread as we've gone through tonight. We're moving away from paper currency into what? A system of trust. What is credit? It's just putting the name on the very system we've just described. All of that history that backs up the dollar, there's a word behind all of that. Trustworthiness. When we accept a loan, what is it that we're promising? That we're good for it. In what way are we good for it? If it's not with gold, if it's not with goats, how are we good for it then? Ah, it's our history. Why do you trust the man with the goat again? Because he has a history of reliability. All the times that you've needed him to be good for it, he's been good for it. Your credit score, if you're 17 years old and you open your first credit card, the reason that they will not lend to you very much money, that's your credit limit, is because you have no history of trustworthiness. Now, why does a co-signer exist? Why is that a thing? They are saying, I don't trust you, but the person who's signing with you has been good for it in the past. Say it's a parent with established credit. What is established credit? It's exactly that. It means that you have, in the past, demonstrated your reliability. You have established your credibility. Established credit. So, that's what credit is. A measurement of your reputation. And that is exactly what there was all the way back with goats and carrots. You didn't have it with you to exchange in a barter system right then and there. It was based on your credibility that you could be trusted to deliver down the line. We're now using systems of credit. The bank trusts you with more, the more you can demonstrate your ability to handle greater and greater amounts of it. Which brings us to crypto. In the light of what we've talked about, how all these other currencies work, what is crypto? The mechanics of crypto are simple enough to understand, but understanding the machinations of it is integral to understanding its philosophy and how its philosophy matters. For those of you unfamiliar, this will be interesting. For those of you who already know these things, correct me where I'm wrong. By all means, I don't know everything. Like I said, just some dude, some guy in a tie. Very simply put, in the lore of Bitcoin is that an anonymous person created this system. Keep that in mind. They created a system of a limited print currency. What kind of currency? A fiat currency. A fiat currency backed by what? The exact same thing that these others are. A belief that it holds value and its acceptance as something of value. The implications of each piece of this is just... Now, what is the significance of the person behind it being anonymous? Yes, there's speculation about who it is and where they're from, and none of that matters for the purpose of this discussion. What is the significance of them being anonymous and their location being anonymous? The anonymity means that the person's reputation is not conflated with the currency's reputation. Now, what does this also mean? It means that it's not tied to a country. Why would some people refuse to buy something made in China? Are the goods not mostly fine? Are they not acceptable? Why is Chinese currency devalued in some places? Because of China's reputation. No, there's something underneath it, right? There's a philosophy under it. I won't do it for these reasons. I won't support with something of value. Value? There seems to be a conflict of what value means even in those systems. What about the ruble? Why won't people trust the ruble? Because of its reputation. Because of to whom the ruble is affiliated. Just like your credit score, your reputation precedes you. That is a key takeaway here in this entire thing. What is different, therefore, about Bitcoin? We'll just use Bitcoin for this example. I know there's a thousand others now. What's different about Bitcoin? It was created by an anonymous person of anonymous origin. No baggage. 
No reputation by what if what if it was uh, Jeff Bezos? What if it was Jeff Bezos that created it? Baggage. Love him, hate him, doesn't matter. It's not a clean slate. There's baggage with his name, with his company, with his history. His reputation goes with it. But if you made Bezos coin, a lot of people would have no interest in it because of the person with whom it is affiliated. Now, so others would get on board because of the person with whom it's affiliated and his demonstrated ability to make money. Anonymity, though, means clean slate. No country of affiliation, no personal baggage, limited print. So there's no inflation here that people need to start worrying about. Here's the other facet of this. Crypto is decentralized. What does that mean? It means that it's not controlled by one entity or another. It is spread loaded. That's why the US dollar is so powerful and so prevalent, ubiquitous, because our US military is ubiquitous or our alliances and their militaries. But this structure that upholds the ubiquity of the US dollar relies on its power and the spread loadedness of that, our ability to be everywhere and exert force everywhere. If something happened to the reputation of the United States, the reputation of the US dollar goes down. 9-11, the value of the US dollar plummeted. It came back, but it was scary. How did that happen? America was proved vulnerable. Now, what about Bitcoin? Crypto, all crypto, the idea is it's not tied to a country, which means that it can't fail based on any one country failing or the reputation of any one of them fluctuating. Remember what we said about currency earlier? It needs to remain relatively stable. You can look at a corollary here that is, I think, statistically significant. Why does crypto go up? When does crypto go up? When the US dollar goes down or when other ubiquitous currencies are devalued somehow. They are pulling out one fiat currency, that's the US dollar, and they're putting it in crypto. What does that signal? What is that indicative of? What are the implications of them doing that? Of them taking perfectly good, perfectly accepted US dollars and putting them in this other thing instead that's decentralized and that's not affiliated with the US as distrust in the US military's ability to extend and exert force falls. Crypto goes up. Ultimately, the success of crypto can be seen as a correlate to the distrust in the traditional systems of fiat. There's a loss of trust in the US dollar. What don't they trust? What don't people? What don't your friend, your some of you here who are getting into crypto? What 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 what's not to trust in the US dollar? What faith might one, an individual citizen, say in uh, California, lose trust in? What are they losing trust in? That would make them lose trust in the dollar. What are people afraid of? Let's put a name to it. What is it specifically that people fear about governments and their current system of fiat? War. War is a big one. What happens to Deutsche Marks when the country is basically obliterated? Whatever money you had in Deutsche Marks. Gone. What people are afraid of, what you can put a name to, you can give a face to the fear. Collapse. Ostensibly, crypto is immune to that. Ostensibly, crypto doesn't care if we go to war. Ostensibly, it doesn't care if a country collapses. It's not tied to a country. If something should befall the United States, any of its major allies or its enemies, something radical would shift with current currencies. Theoretically, it shouldn't with crypto. That's the reason people are doing it. There's a lot to understand. There's a lot to say about those things. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Mr. Tibb, thank you. I thank you for the follow. Vote of confidence that this is a thing that should exist in the world. I appreciate it very much. Her kind words are not wasted on me. Hey, if you guys, if you guys are interested in this and you're, you're thinking that this isn't the worst thing that you could be doing with your Friday night and that this particular mug isn't the worst mug in the world and neither is this mug, then, um... My name's Gus. Uh, welcome in. Uh, this is my Twitch channel. I'm also dual streaming to YouTube. We're in both places right now. And there's also a lovely Discord community. I do hope you'll join us. Perhaps partake of good drink, comfy chair, good conversation, good company. Here's friends. Good gracious. A pleasure to have you. It always is. Hmm. Sorry, I got derailed. I meant to explain the machinations of crypto. So here's how it works. Okay, very quickly. Here's how Bitcoin is supposed to work. You're a Tesla dealership. I say to you, I would like a Tesla model, whatever. And you say, great. How would you like to square the amount? What is our trade going to be? And I say, I will give you one Bitcoin for it. They say, great. How do they know I have a coin? This is the first problem that Bitcoin had to solve. How does the Tesla dealership know that I even have a coin? Back in the beginning, there were actually 
coins, physical minted coins, so that you could have something tangible. With a credit card, they have to put it in the machine, it runs through a bunch of systems. If you hand somebody a $100 bill, they might hold it up to the light and do checks to make sure that it's my fake dollar bill, right? How do you do that with Bitcoin? And this is what mining is. I thought, as has been commented on here, I thought that mining meant mining, like gold, pulling new from the earth, pulling it from nothing. It wasn't part of the economy before, and it is now, and it's fine. No, that's not what mining is. It's not intuitive because the name suggests mining. It's not the same. It's proof of work. So this is fascinating. In order to prove that you have this thing, there are a bunch of calculations going on in this big system, okay? Computers all over the place, checking the ledger. Picture a ledger, it's 100 coins, none of them divisible, right? Just for simplicity's sake, 100 Bitcoins exist out there, all right? And I go to a Tesla dealership and I say, I want to give you my one Bitcoin for a car in exchange. And the Elon Musk over there says, sure, I will take your one Bitcoin. There is a transaction that takes place. Now, the ledger that said that there were these 99 people and me all had a Bitcoin, right? But now what is the ledger? The ledger has to change. Now it's 99 people and not me. Where did my Bitcoin go? The ledger must reflect that this has now been passed to someone else. And that transaction is recorded and checked and checked and checked and checked thousands of times. This is one of the unique things about crypto. The notion is that you can't fake a transaction because each transaction is checked and checked and checked by miners. Every single person who is mining is using their computers to run calculations. These systems have to solve complex puzzles to prove that that transaction between me and the Tesla dealership took place. And all of these computers, everyone in the network will do their part to crunch those numbers, to validate and to verify that transaction. Just that one, that's it. What does the system rely on to work? A network of people doing proofs all the time. Now, this is a thing that undergirds the cryptocurrency itself. This is just a machination again. And what do miners get paid in exchange for their work? Fractions, fractions upon fractions upon fractions, tiny little pieces of Bitcoin. If you are a crypto miner, if you're a Bitcoin miner, it means that you've bought into the system and you want some of it. And you're willing also to do the work to benefit the system, to prove its stoutness and it's trustworthy. You are, by taking part in this system, reinforcing the system, just like every other fiat currency. In earning US dollars and then exchanging them for goods, you are reinforcing the acceptance, the acceptability of the US dollar. What's the promise of the US dollar? How do you know that the transactions are legitimate? There's a bunch of security features on it, right? It's got all these printing things, it's got watermarks and all this stuff, so you can make sure it's legitimate. What's the legitimizing thing behind Bitcoin? The checking, the mining. So if I entered the system, if I managed to hack one node of this system and say, I just came into possession of uh, two Bitcoins, that one system will report to the network a transaction of two Bitcoins from one person to me. I know someone who has two and I got them, now they're mine. Only one node will report that. All the others will say, I didn't see that transaction. And there's a threshold for completeness to accept transactions. So one isn't enough demonstrably. So you can't fake it, which means there's possibly, at least in theory, no fraud. Also fascinating. The problem right now, the main problem that Bitcoin and all the other cryptos face is transactability with haste. If I go to that same Tesla dealership, right? And I say, I will give you a Bitcoin in exchange for a Tesla. And they go, that's great. We accept Bitcoin as a currency. What's the problem? You say, ah, oh, yes, here's your Bitcoin. I'm doing the transaction right now. And yes, it's on its way to you. Good deal. And they go, yes. All right, the transaction is underway. Have fun. You take off in the Tesla. How long do you think it takes to verify a transaction for Bitcoin? Some of you might know, a bunch of you might know. The system is so secure, all those numbers need to be crunched all over the place. It takes a long time, like a day. You just drove off with a Tesla. What do they have? A promise that you're good for it. They have a promise from you that you're good for a Bitcoin. And they won't find out till tomorrow if you're actually good for it and you've already driven away with the car. 
that's the current problem that crypto faces. That's it. El Salvador, uh, over the summer, became the first country on earth to accept Bitcoin as legal tender, as a national currency. The problem with El Salvador accepting it as currency, the delay. If you go to the store and you buy groceries with Bitcoin, yeah, you've got an app for it and you can like transact and that's great. The problem is that money, that Bitcoin, doesn't land in their account until tomorrow after it's been verified. Now that might not sound like that big of a deal because yeah, the system of fraud would mean that you'd be found out and presumably they could come get it back. But now the car's used, right? There's all those problems, sure. But what about the other problems, perhaps the unforeseen ones, ones that maybe you guys aren't thinking of? What if Bitcoin crashes between today and tomorrow? Right now, you are willing to pay a one hundredth of a Bitcoin for this thing. And that today, at this hour, is valued at this much. What about tomorrow? You made that perfectly good exchange today between two cognizant functioning adults who said, yes, I have this much value. You have that thing that I value at this much. Will you take this currency in exchange for it? Yes, I will. I value the Bitcoin that you have. I trust its system and its validity, especially now that it's backed by our government. And I will accept your currency in exchange for my goods or services. You agree on a rate, and then tomorrow, the rate is different. That's no good. Stability is one of the qualities that we talked about earlier that defines money. Relative stability. Now, the system is still in its relative infancy, so stability might yet come. But right now, it fluctuates. It's dangerous. Now, the problems with crypto are myriad. Yes, there's risks to all things that we do, so this is no different. Remember what I said earlier about war? Let me ask you this. What if there was an EMP instead? What if it wasn't a specific country that was attacked? What if it was the grid that went down? Well, what is the grid? The grid is the interconnectedness of this whole thing. The internet can, yes, exist in pockets and pieces, but large hunks of it exist in reachable, touchable locations. What if it went down? What would happen to this system of checks and balances of Bitcoin, of crypto generally? What would happen to the ledger? The same thing that happened when the World Trade Center was hit. The World Trade Center held records. The World Trade Center was the ledger. I know one gentleman personally who lost $12 million. Gone. And there's no recourse. There's no getting it back. $12 million US dollars. What happens if the grid gets hit? It's not a rhetorical question. The answer is, we go back. Back to what? Tell me. All the things we talked about tonight, all the promises, all of the IOUs, what is it that I said were the three things that we will barter for, trade for, fight for? What are the three things that we seek? Food, water, shelter. Tell me, when the system goes down, how far will your Bitcoin take you? Can you eat your Bitcoin? How about your US dollars? There's a fascinating precedent for that. Deutsche Marks. Look them up. Don't take my word for it. As with everything in these talks, don't take my word for it. Look it up. I'm giving you guys information as a launch pad for your own understanding and learning. You will find historical examples of them printing so much of them that people used to go to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread with a wheelbarrow cash. You can find pictures of people who lined the walls of their homes with dollar bills, with hundred dollar bills as wallpaper. Why? Because hundred dollar bills for the square footage that they covered were of less value than wallpaper. People were using it as tinder to light their fires, as firewood, because it was cheaper than firewood. And now we take our final step. When it comes down, the question is, what good, literally, is the piece of currency that you're holding? If it's a Euro coin, you can't even burn that. When it all comes tumbling down, what good is the thing that you're holding? Or might I pose the question another way? Of what value is that stack of cash you have? What has value? It's not US dollars. It's not Bitcoin, it's goats and carrots. And this brings us to our title. This is full circle for all of the things. I had one of these young military folks ask me, so what about the proposition that we go to a $15 minimum wage? And I said, now you understand all of this about value, right? You've got to grasp all of those things. Your question to me is, is $15 an hour good? It depends. How much does a loaf of bread cost? I said, tell me, how much do you pay for a loaf of bread right now in the store? A decent loaf of bread, not a Walmart loaf of bread, like an actual loaf of bread. $3, $3.50, all right. $15 an hour, seems like decent numbers, sure. I said, all right, now uh, a loaf of bread is $7. Is $15 an hour a good wage now? No. Well, what would be acceptable to you? I said, how about $25 an hour? Why settle for 15? 
forget the loaf of bread. Why not fifty dollars an hour? And they went, oh, fifty dollars an hour. And I said, okay, how about a hundred dollars an hour? Whoa, okay. I mean, how about a thousand dollars an hour? They got the picture. None of those numbers matter. I think you'll find this next point illuminating. I ask you, what is the value of a loaf of bread? Depends how many loaves of bread are left. If the systems come down, and there's one loaf of bread left, how valuable is that loaf of bread? So, this is the, the next question I asked her, okay? We talked about going up. What about going down? I said, what about a $7 minimum wage? And they went, whoa. And I said, and a loaf of bread costs five cents. Oh, $7 an hour is sounding pretty fly right now, right? How much did gas used to cost? How much did a loaf of bread used to cost? We have pieces of history, tangible pieces of history, around us each day, and we don't think about it. Remember what I said earlier about the U.S. change? Quarters, dimes, pennies? What are they? Reminders of what value things used to have. The reason that pennies exist is, yes, fungibility so that things can be divisible. But why pennies? Because pennies used to be worth something. You used to be able to exchange a penny for something, or a handful of pennies. The implication of the existence of a penny implies that these tiny amounts made a difference. That three cents, four cents made a difference. We now have a war on the penny. I think Obama tried to abolish the penny and everybody lost their minds. And he's like, it's a pragmatic step. And there's sentimentalists who say, well, it's part of our history. Lincoln's there. And he's like, well, Lincoln's on the five. He'll be fine. Interesting that they think that the historicity of the penny is of more value than the loss for minting. Value. Everywhere we've gone tonight, the word value keeps popping up. It's inescapable. What is value? The next question that I asked this young gal who asked about the $15 minimum wage. If the system is down, the grid goes down, would you show up to work tomorrow for your minimum wage job on the promise that they're going to give you a paycheck for $15 an hour of that time? Say it was $30 an hour. Say it was $100 an hour, but the grid was down and there was no hope of it coming back up. Would you show up to work tomorrow? No. I propose that you wouldn't. Now, it again depends on what you value. What if you find that the thing that you do, you do not for the paycheck, but for the thing itself? What if you're passionate about your work? What if you find the thing that you do to be worthwhile, worth doing for either your sake, for others' sake, or for its own sake? Now, if you just worked for some company that you didn't care about, they didn't have the best reputation, they didn't whatever, you'd make a judgment call. You'd assess. If you knew that it was up in the air and who knows, that's why people leave. When they see that there's layoffs happening, what is it that they're afraid of? What do they lose confidence in? Job security. What if they're really good at their job? Doesn't matter. Everything that they thought they knew is gone. The system of understanding one's value add to the company where you were the best is now out the window. They just fired number three and you knew number three. They were good at their job too. Who's to say that you're safe? Your system of valuation for your time and skill, what you bring is upturned. What is of value? when the system that you've put your faith in is stabilized. That's the question of this whole thing. No matter which of these systems we've talked about tonight, fiat currencies attached to a government, cryptocurrencies, goats and carrots, when that system of credibility is shaken, nothing is certain, and you will reevaluate. The word I just used. I love it. Oh, I got a little bit. Oh, it's so good. That word, which word did I just use that we use all the time that we don't think about when it all is destabilized and all of your stuff is upturned, you will re-evaluate. There's the word I want to leave you with. Evaluate. Assess the value of re-evaluate means to do it over again, to put together a new proposition for value different from your old. You will reassign value based on your circumstances. As we close tonight, that is the question. I want $20 an hour solve all your problems because value is subjective. It is subjective at any given time. And the systems that we rely on every single day depend on relative stability and predictability. That's why we invest in the things we do. We expect continued stability in those systems and we bank on it. Literally, we literally bank on the continued flatness or a slight uptick of those systems. We do not count on their devaluation. I won't go into bear markets and betting on those. 
why won't $20 solve your problem? Because oftentimes your problems are not tied to the $20 an hour. If your problems can't be solved with $20 an hour, there's a good chance that $50 an hour won't solve them either. You guys will no doubt be familiar with the paradox of doctors. Some people who want to be doctors do it for the money, right? Get a boat, get a nice house, get um, some ATVs, get some toys, right? When do they get to use those? I personally know a man, his whole career, he was very interested in getting a yacht and he invested and was smart with his investments and he worked, hustled baby for that boat. Guess how often he got to use the boat? The paradox is in spending all of that time to get it, he never got to use it. The story is a little more complex than this, but he got the boat and it turns out that the boat needs to be so big that it requires a crew. It has to be staffed and it has to be moved from harbor to harbor, from coast to coast, depending on the season. Turns out it's a huge expense to have a yacht. And ultimately he found a relationship, a, a working relationship that could work for him. He hired a family to live on the yacht for like 10 months out of the year and move it from harbor to harbor. They upkept the boat, they did all these things just so he could have it available to him when he took his vacation once a year. What good, I ask you, is his doctor's salary if he doesn't get to spend it? Value. There are some things that money can't buy. Some people will work a hundred dollar hour jobs and hate their job and be miserable. After hours, on call, all this stuff, make all that money for what? What is the cost? Their health, their time, their relationships. Value is subjective to each of us. And when the system changes, the, change, the system always changes. When the system changes in any meaningfully drastic way, we will, all of us, re-evaluate what we value. There's an old story of basically the exact same setup as this person that I know in real life with the boat. This man, he worked his whole life. He hustled, he understood business, he understood expanding his business, and he finally gets to his retirement golden years, and he goes down to a beach in Mexico. He sits there and he takes in the sun, and while he's there, he sees a young man and his young son with this rickety old boat on the shore. And he sees them launch, and go out and fish and they come back with one or two fish and that's it and then he sees this thing repeated for the week he sees that they just go out and they spend all this time out there and they just bring back like two fish each time finally he stops him and he says excuse me i can't help but notice that you guys are out here fishing and you're catching one or two fish each time and he says why are you out here catching the fish and he says oh we catch them to feed our family and he says well okay but hey look let me give you some advice here pal you guys eat two fish a day okay i know a thing or two about business and let me tell you what you ought to do is catch three fish a day. You net the two, right? And you eat those. And that's enough to sustain you two. But you take that third one and you bring it to market. You do this enough that you can save up to upgrade the size of your boat. Over years of work, you'll do this. And then you bring a bigger boat, which means you can go out further and catch bigger fish that you can bring to market, which will yield even more return for your time out there. And then once you have enough money, now you can hire out more workers to go out and fish. You'll have a fleet of boats. And they spread load and then you do this and then more and you go further out and you've got the deep sea catches and you can diversify what kind of catch and bait and tackle and all these things that you do and you'll have this fleet of boats and you work hard and if you stick with it and you're strict and you're diligent and you're and you're disciplined with your work and your effort and your costs and you're on top of all of these things then in 30 or 40 years of your time you will have enough money that you can go to the beach somewhere and fish for leisure and the man shook his head and walked away with his son and they're two fish. That, friends, is where we will leave it. If you're not following on Twitch, maybe consider it. Same thing on YouTube. If you're not subscribed on YouTube, there's more to come. I want to make content of value. Because you have value. I want to make meaningful content. Because you're meaningful. I want to make content that matters. Because you do. It's been a privilege to have done it with you guys for as long as I have now. I hope you'll find me in the Discord as so many other lovely humans have. In the meantime, I wish for you all... Marvelous evenings, mornings, wherever ye be, and I will see you on the other side.